This film is based on only some things that might be true. So, you've chosen to go to Independence. Fasten your seatbelts. We could be in for a long ride. With a wee victory for the Yes campaign, Scotland votes to leave the UK. There is much rejoicing. Except there isn't. Celebrations are short. Confusion and uncertainty sets in, followed by much negotiating. Scotland is now viewed as a foreign country. And while civil, negotiations are rocky, with both sides protecting their national interests. The first big issue is the currency. There are three options for a currency. Option one, a currency union with some influence over Bank of England policy. Option two, sterlingization, where the currency is used anyway, but with no influence over Bank of England policy, a bit like Monaco with the euro. Option three, is for Scotland to issue its own currency. The first option is too risky for the R.U.K. That's the bit without the top part. The second option is too risky for Scotland. That's the bit without the bottom part. So Scotland chooses the third option. But this makes business nervous. And dividing the debt? For dividing the debt, too, there are three options. Option one is to walk away from it. But this means that English, Northern Irish, and Welsh taxpayers will have to shoulder Scotland's share too. And this scares some European states with their own independence movements. It might lead to a veto over EU membership. The second option is to take a population share. But if Scotland's new currency is worth less than the pound, this might make it harder to pay back. Or the third option is a historic share. This means working out how much Scotland owes from a certain date, such as 1980, when North Sea oil revenues began flowing. The Scottish government wants to go left. The RUK government wants Scots to go right. They compromise on going straight ahead. Well, kind of. Unsurprisingly, the social pact between the two countries, that's the pact where all parts of the UK help out each other by sharing the risks and rewards of being in a union, falls off a cliff. There is some good news, however. Scotland gets a geographic share of the oil. And more good news. The price of oil is going up. But there's volatility. Next stop, Europe. In short, Scotland's entry into the European Union goes something like this. Can we come in? No. Are you sure? Well... After a bit of posturing, the EU realized it'd be one hell of a mess to make Scotland exit the EU and reapply. In a classic EU fudge, EU members agree to fast-track the process. So, bienvenue Scotland. Then there's the issue of Trident, which Scotland doesn't want. This doesn't make NATO happy. Without Trident, the Scottish government can cut defense spending. But that comes later. It takes time to move nuclear submarines. Scotland establishes a wee defense force. Scotland is now free to pursue different policy paths. This means more equality and lots of free stuff funded by the government. Uh, well, kind of free. Remember the price of oil, which is supposed to pay for it, goes up and down. And what about Scotland's aging population? In 2016, Scotland begins opening the doors to immigration, at least a little bit. The free travel area negotiated with the RUK limits the number of immigrants Scotland can take in. Many citizens in the RUK want more controls on immigration, and it transpires, so do some citizens in Scotland. By 2017, with oil revenues declining and the population aging, Scotland's deficit is closed. But in a twist, the RUK votes to withdraw from the EU. In a shrewd move, Scotland reduces corporation tax and starts to attract investment from firms exporting to the EU. By 2020, after quite a ride, Scotland's economy is recovering, its public finances are improving, and under its new constitution, it begins establishing a Scottish brand of social democratic politics. Well, we hope you enjoyed the ride. 
fasten your seatbelts, and enjoy the ride. In the 2014 referendum, Scotland says no. Before the 2014 referendum, the main unionist parties pledged more devolved tax and welfare powers for Scotland. The proposed evolution of more powers set out in the Lib Dems' proposal for home rule, called Campbell II, Labour's Devo More, and the Conservatives' Devo Plus proposals outlined in their Strathclyde Commission, could have a noticeable impact for Scots in terms of higher or lower benefits received, taxes paid, and economic growth. But, following the referendum, Maybe the Unionist parties were getting confused over what powers were being devolved, or the politicians couldn't agree about their proposals in the run-up to the UK general election of 2015. Or they just plain forgot after the election, because they were fading from memory. Could this be 1979 all over again? Not so. The Scotland Act 2012 kicks in, and by 2016, Scotland has new powers to vary its income tax rates and control 40% of its income tax revenue. So despite being a no vote, with everyone thinking nothing would change, the political landscape was already changing. In fact, very soon Scotland has significant revenue-raising ability. And they call this losing the referendum? That's not all. The Scotland Act gives Scotland the power to borrow money. The tidy sum of up to £500 million a year, in fact. Following the referendum in 2014, London moved quickly to enshrine the principle of mutual respect as a constitutional obligation and suggested creating a third category of powers, partnership powers, to ensure joint working between governments in areas such as cross-border transport, energy, and strategic welfare policy. But with more powers comes accountability and choices over tax and spend. And London begins tinkering with the Barnett formula. That's the formula used to calculate how much money Scotland receives. With new tax-setting powers, Scotland's block grant is reduced. And there were more twists and turns. The Eurosceptics force a UK referendum on the EU. The UK votes to stay in the EU by a slim majority, with the slightly more, but not a lot more, pro-Euro-Scottish vote making a difference. And with a close call, the EU agrees to give more powers back to the UK. It's 2018 and things are settling down. Scotland's reindustrialization strategy is paying dividends. And publicly funded childcare has been introduced. But then comes a big but. What about the Unionist pledges for more devolved powers? Scotland's population is getting older, putting pressure on Scottish government finances. London controls immigration. With Scottish nationalism once again on the rise following the Scottish election of 2016, another independence debate kicks off. For London, the penny is finally dropping. With such a close call in the referendum and UK relationships becoming strained, London moves to devolve more powers to Scotland. But the same old battle with unionists begins as the nationalists try for another referendum on independence. So here we go again. Stop! I want to get off!